we spend uh, about 300 million euro a year in, on, on medicines. Uh, in, in the community as well, high technology medicines are costing close to half a billion. Uh, when a patient comes into hospital, uh, there's a 1 in 20 chance that the reason they came in was as a result of the medication they're taking and it would, would be a preventable event. Then the patient uh, sees several healthcare professionals and has their history taken and part of that history is the medication history and unfortunately it's not always complete and or accurate. And it's been proven time and time again that pharmacists actually take far more accurate histories than other healthcare professionals, and that's what we do every day. You'll see two of us down in A&E every morning. Um, so my question to you is, if we have a 25% defect rate in terms of obtaining a medication history that's accurate, what are our chances of treating the patient appropriately? And if at the other end, uh, when the patient is discharged, we have a similar defect rate. What are the chances the patient's going to stay out of hospital? Are they going to bounce back again? So we operate in an environment or a system that really isn't designed for patients in terms of their journey being assured. Uh, and in the US they quote somewhere between five and 10,000 deaths a year as a result of medication misadventure. In Ireland in particular, we, with the process improvement hat on, we've looked at our processes and I figure we have at least 14 wasteful steps in every dispensing of a prescription, uh, which is approximately 40 to 50 percent of all the steps. Uh, and we, in our hospital, perform a thousand transactions a day on average. So we operate in a zero tech environment. And my message, if there's anybody here that influences the HSE in terms of health economics, they need to seriously look at why we have been refused any technology in the last 20 years in hospital pharmacy, because it's costing the state a fortune. I'll give you a case study uh, which we encountered recently, and it sort of highlights the, the issues that Alison's raising in a perhaps a more generalist manner. Um, uh, and then I'll give you a personal case study. We recently saw a 54-year-old male in the emergency department and he was admitted with chest pains thought to be cardiac. He also had acute pain in the joints and he had a history of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, when pharmacists hear rheumatoid arthritis, the, the radar goes up because we know that that condition is associated with multiple drug use, it's associated with um, very toxic medications and we need to take a very accurate history. And it was just fortunate for this guy that uh, it happened to be a teaching session for one of our visiting pharmacists because we may not have taken as much time as we normally would given the pressure that we're under. But it's interesting that this chap had been taking, uh, there's a spelling mistake there actually, it's not very good, but He'd been taking diclofenac, which is an anti-inflammatory, for the last two weeks to relieve the symptoms of arthritis. He was non-compliant with his statins, which are used to treat cholesterol, and he had a stent in his heart. So he had a strong history of cardiovascular disease. And when we discussed things a little bit further with him, we also discovered that he was non-compliant with his DMARD. Now, I'll explain that. That is a disease-modifying drug for arthritis. But as several other speakers have alluded to, either in their presentations or in private conversations this morning, there's a temporal lag between the effect of a drug and when you first start taking it. And there can also be a temporal lag between the time you stop taking it and the effect wearing off. And it could be several months. So this chap had been taking his methotrexate for two years. His symptoms had improved, and therefore he didn't think he needed it anymore. And he had stopped it. <coughs> and it's quite possible that his non-compliance with his basic preventer for rheumatoid arthritis was a contributing factor to the arthritis flare, and 
more recently, uh, there's a lot of reports in the medical literature that the anti-inflammatory he was taking is associated with myocardial infarction and stroke. So now we can begin to see the repercussions of non-compliance where, in this case, adherence would have been a good idea. So the fallout in terms of the economic costs are multiple. Um, and it would not surprise me if repercussions such as the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis with much more expensive biologicals might be considered an option because this patient was resistant to methotrexate, when in fact he wasn't really resistant, he just didn't understand the drug. He didn't understand how it worked. He didn't <coughs> understand the latency of action. Uh, perhaps it had or hadn't been explained to him. I don't know. Perhaps if it was explained to him, he didn't make a connection with the communicator in a way that, that changed his behaviour. And it's also quite possible that the anti-inflammatory was a reason for admission. So this adherence thing is not easy, and it is all about changing behaviour. And fundamentally, it comes down to trust, which is the subject of my next case study. Somebody very, very close to me would have suffered severe depression and uh, would have been hospitalised for depression and, and uh, diagnosed as bipolar. I'm not sure about that diagnosis because what I know now is that that patient who was on a list of drugs not too dissimilar to Alison's, not quite as bad, is now drug free. Now, that process is a result of a lot of support from myself, um, somebody who can bridge the gap between the medic and the patient, who can share the concerns they may have about their medicines, who can, quit, who can ask in a respectful way, are you sure about this diagnosis? Would you like to explain to me why you think this person has this condition? This person is now drug free for several years, uh, uh, practices yoga on a daily basis, swims and cycles. That's their therapy. So I think we're right to question the role of medication. We're right to question whether adherence is always a good thing. Fundamentally, though, I believe trust in the system which we have fundamentally may influence how patients adhere to their therapy. So if we have a system that is only going to get it right three quarters of the time when we walk in the door... How much faith do we have in the medical system that we use? Uh, and perhaps we need to be looking far deeper into adherence and changing behaviour and asking ourselves as pharmacists, doctors and nurses, should we be changing our behaviour? Should we be looking at our systems to work out is there a better way of making that patient's journey one which they can trust in. So here we are in Ireland. The good news in 2015, 2014, eHealth came along as part of a European initiative and uh, I'd be fortunate enough to be one of the clinical information officers on the national programme and there is a lot of talk at the moment about actually introducing technology for the benefit of patients. I hope it happens, I genuinely hope it happens because if we were to deploy technology, um, pharmacists could work much closer with nurses who are too busy to care and doctors to provide a multi-pronged approach to communicating and understanding patients' needs in relation to their medicines. And that, fundamentally, is where you're going to get adherence. So what we need is a, is a hospital pharmacy system that doesn't produce erroneous labels, as it does now. What we need is a hospital pharmacy system that allows us business intelligence, which we've had to deploy through third-party providers, uh, through alliances which have serendipitously taken place with people like Boston Scientific. Um, so I would urge health economists to start talking to hospital pharmacists around the country. I've been part of a national 
uh, team that were asked to continue to invest in a solution that we've inherited for 20 years and we were not allowed to question the choice of the product. So I'm saying very strongly, uh, if we can leverage pharmacy expertise to get people out to patients instead of throwing drugs out the door, you have a much better system that is going to be closer to the patient that will enable us to work together to improve <coughs> their trust in the system and I suspect their adherence. So essentially what we do a lot in healthcare at the moment is concentrate on flow, getting people through the system faster. Number one though is safety. So if we can get this right by redesigning systems, we have a much better chance of getting the right medicine to the right patient and making the system flow. Patient believes in the system and therefore we get productivity gains. Unfortunately, what we tend to do is start here and think that that's going to solve the problem, and it doesn't. So, there's an elephant in the room. It's not just about adherence, it's about looking at the system that is trying to improve it and fundamentally questioning, is the system designed and fit for purpose? What is the cost of poor technology infrastructure? What are the productivity losses and lost opportunities? And we've studied that recently in the last six months in our pharmacy. Uh, how can we improve adherence strategies in a patient-focused way? When will modern electronic health records and robotic systems de be deployed so that we can leverage our people? Our people have been trained in the last 12 months to get closer to patients. All our technical people have been trained to do that. We are waiting for the initiative centrally to leverage their expertise. And we have had, in our hospital pharmacy, come across two erroneous national medication guidelines which have been published without pharmacist involvement. So hospital pharmacy, <coughs> community pharmacy, has a key role in medicines management. We are as Andrew Barber, my boss, says, the gatekeepers of medicines information. We take our job very seriously uh, and we're very good at it if we're given the chance. Uh, and I suppose the last thing before I go is if I do duck out early, it's not because I don't want to be here. I just have to get back to the hospital. <laughs> so thank you very much.